I am coming to you uh, from Melbourne, Australia, where I'm not rubbing it in. Uh, we don't have very many COVID cases. And one of the reasons for that is because, as you may know, in Australia, they impose the policies in a very firm way. And one of the findings from the science here is that if you wear a coat and tie, you're much more vulnerable to the virus. So I'm just complying with the local dress code by not wearing a coat and tie for this session. And again, not to rub it in, it is summer here, so it would seem inappropriate. So apologies for my sartorial inelegance. And in any case, this isn't my show, it's the show of the debaters. I welcome once again to our a fun session of quips, quandaries, and comebacks, the annual debate. And as usual, the quality forum people have chosen a wonderful topic that is both that is actually also timely, of course, which is resolved that COVID-19 has put an end to quality improvement. Note that they said it put it to an end, and they didn't say it grounded to a halt or it slowed down the imperceptible pace of improvement even more, but actually put it to an end. And you may be thinking, well, that can't be true because if it really put it to an end, there wouldn't be a conference. And that's a good point. And also if it put it to an end, uh, half of you listening to this debate wouldn't be here because you would have been furloughed. And I'm very glad to hear that you haven't been and that if anything, you're just on hiatus from quality improvement because you're out there vaccinating people with Canada's legendarily excellent supply of the vaccine. And now on the other hand, you may say, well, of course the, the anti-side has this in hand because quality improvement is a juggernaut in Canada. It is expanded spectacularly and in British Columbia in particular due to the great work of the BC Quality Forum, BC Safety and Quality Council, and all of you who are working in the system, it's a humming health system. The one that the Commonwealth Fund generally rates as number one in the world among 11 rich countries, except for eight or nine others. So maybe there's a bit of work to do. In any case, we have four fantastic debaters uh, who are going to pursue this. Uh, and on the four side, we have Beverly Pomeroy, who is a patient partner with the BC Support Unit and a Patient Voices Network. And she will be joined by Hussein Kanji, who is the Medical Director, High Acuity Unit at Vancouver General Hospital and the Clinical Lead Critical Care for the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council. They will be arguing for the proposition, which is again, that COVID has put an end to quality improvement, at least temporarily. And on the negative side of the resolution, we have again, two fabulous debaters. We have Carl Meadows, who is the executive director, clinical operations, acute and community for interior health. And he, she, he will be joined by Mandy Mann, a registered nurse and a quality lead for Vancouver Coastal Health who, if she believes her side of the debate, will be in a state of existential crisis due to the COVID debate and not uh, the COVID pandemic. But I assure you, as usual, and with the disclaimer, remember that this is a debate that's supposed to be not only enlightening, but also fun. And we recognize that it is often difficult to argue the side that you actually believe and people will be having some good times uh, making some points that they probably don't internally believe. So. We remind you that as our typical disclaimer, these are brave people who have taken the side of the arguments that we have assigned to them. They will be making cases uh, in order to debate and they are not representing their organizations or probably even 100% of their own actual views. Uh, before we get started, uh, we want to uh, poll the audience uh, because with these debates to see who's, who has won the debate, it's not the people who have the the uh, side that you are naturally inclined to support, but the ones who have changed the most hearts and minds here. So uh, I believe if this is working, uh, there should be a, uh, on your screen, there should be an engage button that allows you to vote on which side of the debate you are inclined to support at the outset. So if you are inclined to believe the affirmative side, that is that COVID-19 has put an end to quality improvement, you will vote for that side. And, and otherwise, if you don't agree with that, you will vote against. So if we, if the tech's working, can we uh, please open the voting? We'll give you a few seconds to do that. And then I believe the results will be displayed.
Well, it's a really close call so far. It's sort of like an election in Belarus. So there you have it, uh, as one would expect, the anti-side uh, is your natural inclination since this is a quality improvement community and we would all want to believe that quality improvement has not in fact been put to an end or ground to a halt because of the COVID, COVID uh, pandemic. So an uphill battle on changing hearts and minds uh, for sure. So before we begin, I'm just going to remind everybody of the format. Uh, we keep the presentations relatively brief because of the, inter of the interim session, which I will get to in a second. There, we will go four against four against each opening speaker in round one will have two and a half minutes. We have invoked uh, high technology in order to remind the speakers when they are coming to the end of their two and a half minutes. This is it. So I will put that up um, and you'll hold people to time in, in service of fairness. We will go A, B, A, B. Uh, for both sides, um, I will let you uh, decide on the order of the speakers. And rather than me introduce the other side, we'll just let you segue on your own. So after the affirmative opener begins for two and a half minutes, then the negative uh, opener just start right after. I've got my eye on the clock and I'll let you know. After the opening rounds, we have what is really a, a, the enlightenment and additional fun part of this, which is where I sort of interview and probe the presenters for about 18 minutes, just so they can elaborate on their arguments. And ideally, uh, in addition to having fun, we find some common ground, we tease out the themes, and we extract some nuggets that allow people to actually take home some messages that are, that are useful in the pursuit of quality improvement uh, when the conference ends and everybody goes back to work. So uh, I believe that uh, is the end of the uh, introductions and in service of giving everybody lots of time, let us begin. So let me turn you over to the first affirmative speaker. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Stephen. It's nice to see you again, everybody. I'm Bev Pomeroy, as I've been introduced, and I'm here as a patient partner. Um, and nice to throw me under the bus at 88% against and uh, put the patient partner in that position. And uh, yeah, so this will be interesting. But thanks, Stephen. I thought you disappeared to uh, be with the thunder down under. So it's nice to see your face again this year for uh, Quality Forum. So thanks for that. Um, so you know, we're talking about this interesting debate. So from a patient or service user perspective, as, as soon as COVID-19 hit, quality improvement went from standing for uh, quality improvement to quick and insufficient and quickly ignored. Uh, patients and families were quite literally elbowed out of the way. We were not included in procedural adaptations, service delivery changes or planning, Never mind informing policy, emergency preparedness, and operations, the list goes on. What was important for patients and families was completely disregarded, and unfortunately, in many ways, still are. And I understand and appreciate that priorities needed to be on the very sick and dying during COVID, and that safety took precedence. That's the right thing to do, but not at the expense of quality of care, which from our lens means quality of experience and even quality of life. My layperson's understanding of QI is that it's cyclical, this PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. And our experience with COVID in the community is that the first three steps in that cycle disappeared entirely, and patients were derailed by a giant act avalanche. You just have to ask the doctors, nurses, the respiratory techs who held the hands of our loved ones as they took, our, as they took their last breath. Ask our seniors and their families that were locked down and locked out, isolated to suffer alone. Ask the families of children and young adults with needs that have been abandoned to, you know, to fend on their own. Quality improvement during COVID, you know, I kind of equate it to like decorating your home in the midst of a year-long rainstorm, leaky roof, crappy tarps. You know, you're too busy watching for overflowing buckets to really care about my favorite time of year, the Benjamin Moore's paint color of the year, or what furniture you want to purchase from Wayfair or like we say here on the West Coast, Leon's. You know, it just became this giant game of kick the can. And patients, residents, and families, service users have historically been on the losing team. When COVID hit, honestly, we didn't stand a chance. 
COVID has dramatically amplified existing flaws and gaps that we as patients and service users have been aware of for a long time, way before COVID hit. But we can't even begin to consider quality improvement amid COVID when we are still grappling with our lives. And that's my question today is where does that fit in? Thank you. Over to the mic. Thanks for that wonderful uh, presentation, Bev. I, I thought I needed a Kleenex. And in a moment, I, I actually thought I was on an episode of The View. But um, uh, yeah, quality improvement, in my view, absolutely jumped out of the closet, wink, wink, during COVID. And uh, we used to be in a box. And then a view of the world around quality improvement uh, spread everywhere. I have a visual for everybody. Here is COVID the cheetah, and those are the quality improvement initiatives. So it was really around perfection in the past to survival. COVID emphasized and normalized QI practices. You mentioned BEV PDSAs and uh, physician quality improvement initiatives. I thought Babylon was a new gay lounge in the city of Vancouver, but apparently it was some sort of a technological invention by, I, I guess, TELUS, I'd never heard about it. So really that was around, we pushed into overnight visits and, and remote visits, uh, things that we could never do or they were on the planner for years, all of a sudden became reality. It was around quality, technology and accessibility. And if you didn't adapt, you lost patience. So some accelerated work we did around our 48-6 care planning, because if you didn't have goals, your clients weren't gonna get out. And if your clients didn't get out, your hospitals were gonna be filled with COVID patients. So we had to develop hot and cold zones, again, using that QI lens. Um, uh, our infection control practices had to go through very rapid uh, QI processes and review. PPE, I never even really used those words. I, I didn't know if it was PPE or PPE. Anyways, PPE forced us to actually automate how we tracked our supply, which would never happen. It used to be like counting an abacus. Um, all of a sudden we became automated almost uh, in a week. Um, and again, INIT. So again, these are all around quality improvement initiatives that just came right out. Uh, supply chain improvements, holy mackerel, if you work for government, good luck getting anything done. All of a sudden, uh, everything was done and everything had to be done overnight. So again, uh, rapid movement overnight happened to virtual care. Quality improvement uh, in initiatives went directly into long-term care to evaluate the process. Greeters started to do, again, plan, do, study, act cycle. So Bev, well, I found your uh, debate very compelling. And like I said, I needed a Kleenex. Uh, I think that uh, I've made a pretty strong argument that uh, quality improvement became everything, everywhere, in every place. Thank you very much. Thank you. How are you saying? Thanks, thanks, Carl. It's hard to sort of an act like that. I actually wish I could be a little more intimidating. I was hoping you'd, my voice would sound like Devin's Darth Vader in the, in the initial presentation so I could exude that confidence. But uh, in any case, I'm going to give this a go, and I, I really appreciate you saying we were in a state of survival because that actually will be the thesis of what I'm going to actually push forward. I'm going to passionately argue that COVID has indeed brought an end to quality improvement. I'm going to start with a quote by a decorated war hero, William A. Foster. I hope this won't bring tears to your eyes, Carl. Um, but uh, quality is never an accident. It is always the result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives. Quality also marks the search for an ideal state after necessity has been satisfied and mere usefulness achieved. So why do I say that quality has come to an end? I say because we're living in a state of necessity, as Carl mentioned, survival. And I'll venture to say is that actually quality generally is an afterthought. And what I mean by that is it's action to a retrospective problem. In my opinion, this is a paradigm that needs to change. Why be worse in the past when we can be better in the moment? In a time, Assessment, in time assessment of quality need, needs to be paramount and it's paralyzed during moments of crisis and survival. So how can we say that quality occurred when even our baseline was completely destroyed? The entire baseline of quality care was dis, in a way dismantled. For example, innumerable unexplained deaths during this time, delay in presentation of heart attacks with increased late complications, delay in cancer diagnosis, to name only just a few. But even in these times, we need to focus not on just what we do, but how we do it. They will 
And they will continue to argue that this was an impetus to change, accelerated change, innovation, creative solutions. And indeed, there were. But these solutions were to survive, not to improve. For example, we created team-based learning uh, or team-based nursing at the, at the patient care just to allow our patients to be cared for. We thought this was innovative and wise, and in fact, it was. But however, it resulted, and we learned that it had associated with larger unintended errors, poor care, less mobility, things we know that are potentially going to harm our patients in the long run. So though we can pat ourselves on the back and say we're quick and innovative, in fact, we were doing harm in this process. So I'll end by saying uh, William Foster said, it is quality improvement that occurred after necessity was met, but I implore that it should occur concomitant to necessity and survival. Quality absolutely needs to drive our path forward, not look back upon it. And unfortunately, in the midst of this chaos, the chaos and necessity of survival, we lost this lens. Well, that was brilliant. Away we go. Andy. Thank you, Zane. And uh, very compelling argument, but I would like to disagree. Um, and I'm going to start that by asking you a few questions. And all of you here uh, can't really do a vote this year, but I want you to think about that. First question. Has your work changed in the past year? Second question. Did you have one or more of the QI projects stop because of the pandemic? Now, the most important question, despite all the changes, were you able to embed quality improvement in the work you're doing during the pandemic? Because mine definitely did. Last April, I transitioned from being an eMERGE nurse to doing quality full-time, and their year was definitely not what I expected. I was redeployed. In one afternoon, my desk was cleared and I was told that I only have one task left, COVID support. I went from Elbrick sites to Elbrick sites and did things ranging from PPE donning and docking demonstrations to stocking and setting up change rooms and PPE carts to even swabbing people for COVID. None of these work really seemed QI related, but through the development of processes and implementation of these tasks, I actually got to embed quality improvement concept into daily practices. How do we make sure good PPE practice stays? How should we set up the PPE card so that staff actually use them and find them useful, but not just as extra storage space? And when loss of lives are inevitable, how can we support individuals to die with the dignity that they deserve? I realized at that point that quality improvements are actually not just projects anymore, but an approach. It is about working side by side with residents, families, and staff, facilitating improvements that actually matter to them. Instead of being driven by scorecards, improvements were driven by compassion. Instead of metrics that we're used to, we're actually measured by the number of lives that we can save. More importantly, I think COVID unified and connected all of us who care about QI, regardless of who we are, what we do, or where we work. Impro improvement work invariably involves work across multiple systems and disciplines. Because of the pandemic, we got dispersed. We got to meet people and answer, in my opinion, one of the most common questions. What do you do before COVID? COVID gave us the opportunities to engage and make relationships. It let us open the world's eyes to the world of QI, encouraging and empowering everyone to embrace quality improvement in their practices. Well, that was a spectacular opener for all four of you. Well done. So now we're, we've got about 18 minutes uh, to uh, pursue the themes a little bit deeper. And one of the things that, that came out of this um, was that some of you argued that the crisis, the immediacy, the COVID focus, the hectic pace, the enforced agility meant that you, you really can't do quality improvement in the way we normally do it. And the others have argued, actually, it sort of reminds you of why it's important to do, and it even accelerated it. It, it was almost an opportunity for quality improvement. So let's see if we can find either further differences or some uh, common ground here. And, and I'll, start, uh, I'll start with you, Hussein, because you made a, a very interesting point that in survival and crisis mode, uh, you don't, this is the time just to, get through it all and do what you can. And I'm inferring from what you said is that there's really no opportunity to go through the methodical organized steps of quality improvement. Um, so if that's the case, um, uh, first of all, 
do you think, obviously it's a bit of a crisis, but is it that big an existential crisis to have a, a pandemic that, that you can't do this? Or do you think that, that while it's novel, it's not really that big of a crisis? And in fact, you could possibly do this quality improvement pretty well at the same time. Thanks for the question, Stephen. Um, very good one indeed. And I, I'm not sure exactly how to answer it because I'm gonna agree with uh, several of your points. And one, I believe it's certainly an existential crisis that has encompassed all of us in so many ways and in, in all, all areas and aspects of our lives, be it professionally, physically, emotionally, and the rest. We've been challenged uh, in ways that we've never knew we could be or, or would be. Having said that, I don't think it's that we can't perform the acts of quality improvement. I think the paradigm of quality is, again, looking at run charts and looking at where we have been in the past to be better in the future. And therefore, I guess my argument really is, is that it's because of our culture in looking and improving moving forward, but not in time, that was missed. And we had been cluttered in our process of trying to stay in that survival mode that perhaps, perhaps we have not put as much focus on assuring that the actions that were occurring and the changes that were being made were in fact those shrouded in quality. Ah, interesting. And Mandy, um, you mentioned that it was very interesting um, in your own personal experience that you just shifted into quality and became full-time and then this hit. So you come at this with a fresh set of eyes. Um, and did you find that, um, it, it, compared to what you were expecting, did, have you found it more difficult, neither one or less difficult to actually think in quality improvement mode, given the accelerated pace and the focus that the pandemic has brought? I think given the clinical background and um, kind of bring quite fresh to quality improvement, uh, jumping into it and actually jumping back to support the outbreak really helps me realize how I can marry the two um, in the frontline perspective. A lot of the time kind of people think quality of something that we kind of do way back somewhere. Um, we'll come in and engage when we need something and then we'll go away again. And really this allow us to plant that seed to build the capacity for people to realize that it can be done by anyone, anywhere, um, and to really put QI at the forefront because of this. And then it actually gave us the common goal to do it all together. Right, and following on that, and I'll, I'll, Carl, um, you know, you, you made the point that actually it has accelerated quality improvement in a sense, I, and I'm inferring again, more and more or less out of necessity. The world sped up, uh, you didn't have a lot of time, uh, you had to be extremely agile, and that, that, again, maybe seeds were planted or people had to get religion here because you didn't have any choice. Is that, is that really the case? I mean, do you think more people, because of the pandemic and the circumstances around it, have actually bought into QI processes and rapid cycle improvements? Yes. And the reason why is because we had to. Uh, whether it was the ministry needing data that we actually didn't have that we had to count beads on that had to be accelerated overnight. Uh, there were things in our pipeline for IT improvements that had been on in the pipeline for three years plus. All of a sudden with COVID and the redirection of some of our uh, resources, we had uh, access to technology uh, advances that we hadn't had. And all of a sudden, of course, uh, you know, uh, virtual care and uh, Zoom, Zoom, uh, became our entire world. But I would also like to respond to Hassan because I think Hassan is actually arguing our side other than the fact that he's using a little bit of Plato and I didn't know if I was in a philosophy class or whatever, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, you're actually, in my view, arguing our side, but with more of a philosophical slant to it uh, because whether you talk about an accidental crisis or whatever, I, I mean, really, how could anybody argue that uh, we weren't in rapid improvement process in quality improvement? Uh, I mean, it was just, it's obvious, but I will leave it at that. Thanks for your question, Stephen. <laughs> now, I, I want to, I'll get, oh, I'm sure this ain't as much to rebut in your attempt to win both sides of the debate, Carl, but we'll, we'll, we'll follow that later. But, but Bev, Bev laid down the gauntlet here. Um, you said the world, 
the normal world where we were making great progress as patients in co-design, being engaged, nothing about us without et cetera, et cetera, ground to a halt. And I, again, I'm gathering you're making a strong point that isn't it interesting that when we hit a crisis, that becomes an option all of a sudden and it's not embedded. And then why shouldn't it be embedded into crisis management as it was before? So, so could you expand a little bit about the, again, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but the, 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 the sidelining or marginalization of those good things that you think of it. And, and more to the point, um, do you think what, what in retrospect or now do you think is the remedy? Wow, Stephen, if I had the answer to that, I'd be taking over Christina's job, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you know, maybe Devin, who knows. Um, but, um, you know, short of giving, uh, you know, Carl some Kleenex, I've actually ran out of Kleenex, Carl, for weeping in grief at the loss of QI uh, and patient engagements that's occurred during COVID. So I'd offer you some Kleenex, but honestly, I, I ran out months ago. Um, but, you know, I'm going to kind of speak to it, Stephen, in a, diff in a different way and kind of take, take it off on a bit of a tangent here in that, you know, as patients uh, experienced in these systems, um, what we've come to learn, and Sandra Bloom talks about this, is that, that we have trauma-organized services. So just as lives of people like me as a patient partner, as a patient caregiver, exposed to repetitive and chronic trauma, become organized around traumatic experience. So I'm a breath parent, I had 16 years looking after my daughter, uh, you know, so I, I, my life became organized around traumatic experiences. So that's how my life lived and breathed. I, you know, didn't work out, I didn't eat properly, like all these things, I couldn't make decisions properly. I was just in this heightened, uh, you know, sort of awareness or lack of awareness all the time. So, so too can entire services and organizations and systems become organized around recurrent and severe stress. And we know that's true anyways, but throw in COVID and these organizations, these living systems become incredibly vulnerable to stress. And with COVID, it was chronic, repetitive, stress. It was organizations that were chronically crisis driven, chronically hyper aroused. We know through through Bloom and her colleagues that that those organizations can lose the capacity to manage their own, uh, sorry Carl, emotions institutionally, right? And so this results in a failure to learn from experience. I mean this has been proven, this is evidence, and it's it runs in parallel with patient partners and our experience being caregivers and being patients in the systems. And interestingly enough, when that occurs, organizational leaders are likely to become more authoritarian. And this is exactly what happened in COVID. Organizational leaders and our government became authoritarian. So we have become one giant trauma organized system. So how do you do QI in a trauma organized system? And in order to answer your question, Stephen, that probably take a whole day workshop on how we activate resiliency, which maybe we'll do in maybe we'll do in next year's quality forum. Thank you. I want to, Hussein, I want to, I want to pursue a, a point that you made about the displacement that the fixation, the focus on COVID, has meant, and the and the literature is starting to come out about all of the screening that hasn't gotten done, all of the failure to present with perhaps uh, uh, health-threatening conditions, cardiovascular, cancer, pre-symptomatic or symptomatic stuff. Uh, and, you know, one could argue that that's a, an epidemiological problem, but one could also, from a system perspective, that it's a quality problem because part of quality is meeting needs. And if some needs are being unmet, do you think there is, in a crisis like this, in an all-consuming novel crisis, do you think it's even possible that you can look after the day-to-day -day regular work of the healthcare system, at least at the, at the at the vulnerable end of it, like those kinds of circumstances, and still do pandemic management correct. In other words, do you think do you think the 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 displacement is inevitable, or do you think that there are lessons to be learned about this where we could improve it next time if there is a next time? Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'm I'm actually quite passionate about this point. Um, because I feel that certainly there are lessons to be learned. Of course, we can continue to do better. If we can't, then, you know, I think you're dead at that point. Um, it, it, to answer your question specifically, 
I absolutely believe that the two can be done concomitantly. And it's just that paradigm or that idea that, again, I, I said it before, it's not necessarily what we do, but how we do it. And, and putting that lens on, that allows us to actually assess what is the impact of what we're doing, not necessarily surviving. So uh, we constantly looked at, I stayed up nights on end and worked with a great, wonderful team of people wondering how much harm we're gonna be potentially doing, trying to create uh, our path for survival into something that is completely unknown, but it's having more of a focus on that and a team approach. When we get really tunnel visioned into surviving, and certainly the biggest fear was that unknown, how do we do this? So we're over-prepared in a lot of ways, and we marginalized a lot of people in whom needed care. And we know this, like you said, the literature, you look at Mexico, for example, alone, a quarter million deaths only half of them explained by, by COVID. You're looking at large number amount of uh, unexplained deaths that certainly were the result of us actually, I would argue we did not quality improve, we didn't quality maintain, we quality lost. And so we really need to look at our ability to survive in these times of crisis with a different lens. And I think that needs to be a focus and that's the learning that I'll take and I'll implore that we should all take moving forward. But I, I have to rebut here for a second because, uh, Bev, I'm just going back to your comments uh, around, like, it sounds like you're saying the amygdala hijack and tyranny has stopped quality improvement. And I'm, 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 I'm not following that part of it, right? So I actually, I, I was thinking of Putin and Russia when you were talking, but I'm still not following the point around how it's actually stopped quality improvement. Well, hold on, Carl. Let me let me pursue it. What they're saying that look, you're you're the uh, you've got acute in community under your portfolio. You must have seen the same phenomena that Hussein talked about, which is there are people who aren't showing up for needed care. So you presented this as oh, the pandemic has been a godsend for quality improvement because it accelerated all of these things, but surely it must be in your head that there are unintended consequences here for people how are you how are you managing that i mean how well, thank you for asking because for the clients that had to wait four weeks for their freaking physician what they did they actually just phoned babylon and then their physician's practices dropped 40 percent because the people said actually i'm not waiting three weeks for you i'm actually going to this other service because it's available so that's actually what happened from the customer perspective. So whether the quality, we're not here to uh, argue the quality of that, because that's a whole nother debate. But at the end of the day, customers realized the market was bigger and QI actually led that work to look at quality improvement from that perspective. Thank you. So, so can, I, can, I, can I answer, can I yeah, talk to ahead. Carl? He keeps Please. talking about Babylon and all I can picture is Carl and little Speedo and Glitter dancing around at his nightclub. I um, resent that compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and if you look at even take an example of Stephen's 30 second sign of a jiffy marker on paper, you know, if we're talking about telehealth and innovation and e-health, you know, it's just another delivery model that widens the access gap in our communities, right? I see this as a, another example of innovation for the few without the money. We have, sorry, without the many, we have communities that are not in positions of privilege, that do not have access to reliable internet. The same population often doesn't have enough data or even capable devices to use these services. Many use free Wi-Fi in coffee shops and local community center schools and libraries, but those are all closed or have limited hours and, and access. You can't just sit in a coffee shop anymore. Like I miss my coffee shop people, my central perk. So like the intentions are great. But if we were to co-create with patients and families, which we're not doing, and seek diverse, hardly reached populations, I argue and suggest the view of have we done QI and innovation, telehealth and e-health, I think it would be different. Mandy, why don't you jump in because you your, your, your stuff really touched my heart and I why don't you just say it to them? Thank, um, thank you for doing my job, uh, Can I? Mandy, I do, I do, because you're going to be our last uh, intervener here. We've got about a minute left, but I want to ask you, given given your role in the system, and now that you're you're going through this, but you imagine us at the other end of the pandemic and it's done, what will be your permanent lessons from it as far as you per pursue a QI career? What do you think you will do differently that you may not have even thought about 
had we not had the pandemic. And, and just can, can you elaborate a bit on that? And I think that's what I want to highlight and going back to um, Bev and Hussein's um, argument is that yes, there, we are not perfect. Um, there are things that uh, are missed. There are opportunities that we uh, didn't address. And now looking back, we should have or could have, um, but we don't have a crystal ball. On the other hand, I actually do want to focus on other things that has come out of it. All the uh, engagement that we have had to um, include more frontline staff and include more staff in general. As for patients, um, we also have been engaging uh, patients and family. It's just different. And I think that's what I kind of want to focus on as QI is almost like a chameleon. We just look different now. We The old way of doing QIs um, might have ended is because it's different, but doesn't mean the quality improvement has ended. Improvement is ongoing just um, through a different way of engaging either through surveys and online or looking at different people. Um, like for example, during QI, we have now have one of my colleagues who has uh, survived COVID and now is on the patient experience team and really helping with developing a lot of the post COVID um, clinic and a lot of research and really contributing back from patient experience perspective. So it's ongoing, just different. Well, I want to thank all four of you. This was really outstanding. I think you, you, you have raised some incredibly important issues. I think you have given people a wealth of ideas, not only to navigate the pandemic a little bit better, but to prepare for the future, which is really what this is about. I mean, if we're lucky, this will be a one-off event, but if we're unlucky, although Carl may think we need ongoing pandemics to keep the ball rolling, if I was listening to him correctly. But if we if we periodically have to go through this again, uh, getting good at keeping all of the balls in the air uh, in the juggling act of the health system will be important and strategies for doing it better in repeat times are really important. So a huge thanks to all four of you. And now it's a uh, revote time. So uh, it was about, I think it was 88.12 or 87.13 on the uh, <laughs> incline towards the negative side. So we want you to re-vote, uh, if we can reopen that now. Uh, and then we'll get the results in a few seconds. This is so stressful. Make up your mind. <laughs> this is... Uh, Close, closing arguments as well. Exactly. So we will get to the closing arguments right now. I'm sorry, I should have had you vote uh, after this, my mistake, but I'm glad you all complied. You should be in Australia. Everybody complies with what the government tells us to do. So let's go for the final one, 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 one. And again, we'll take the same order as before. So over to you, Beth. Great, round, round it up with the patient partner again, you guys. Um, you know, so patients and families have been working hard to shift culture and healthcare from a done to to a done with for decades. At risk of aging myself, Hussein and I have the same haircut today. Uh, I happen to be one of those who spent decades in those trenches and COVID's just pushed an already challenging culture change into no man's land. We have found ourselves standing before what feels like a seemingly impermeable wall of regurgitated power dynamics. There is this assumption that engaging with patients and families in quality improvement is cumbersome, takes energy, resources. And while that may be true, it's not a bad thing. We need to consider the patient voice and lens as an essential service in QI in order to ensure that priorities for patients and families are heard, understood, and implemented. And I want to end with both a challenge and an invitation that we take COVID as a wake up call to co-create an environment of quality improvement that is meaningful, safe, and accessible while valuing quality of life and quality of care through our collective experience. Thank you. Okay, over to you, Carl. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, COVID has enhanced and accelerated the quality improvement initiatives across our province and probably the world. COVID-19 created a unique lens on how we approach QI, as Mandy said. It's faster, it's deeper, it's different. Uh, and we really never looked at it seriously because they would have taken years to accomplish many things that were all of a sudden shot out of a cannon overnight. Uh, and we were, and not only were implemented, but actually uh, removing the concept of doing everything perfect was left behind. It was around survival. The work had to be done. 
And if we could not adapt, clients would have been left out without care. So COVID has changed for the better how we look at QI as an organization and as a province. Thank you. Thanks. Hussein. Thanks again, Carl. Again, it was about survival. Uh, our baseline was completely disrupted. It plummeted. How can we be expected to improve when we couldn't even maintain? We were trying to get in this moment ahead of the unknown. We didn't quality improve, we quality lost. But because we lost safety and, and as Bev has mentioned, patient-centric approach, we did our best. We certainly did and we learned. Quality has been, but certainly shouldn't be an afterthought. And if it does, as it has happened, we're destined to hit pause when priorities shift to survival. And in doing so, we paralyze our ability to engage in improvement. Let's be very clear, autonomy and rapid change are not synonymous with quality or improvement. It is not what we do, but how we do it. And without the lack of quality lens, things can actually be very much in, enhanced or, or, or worsen the harm in the guise of necessity. The P and pandemic shouldn't be associated with pause or panic, but preparedness, perseverance, and as Beverly said, patient-centric. No doubt reflections on these months will yield a wealth of improvements. And the biggest one I will argue is that we didn't prioritize improvement. Thank you. And last word to you, Mandy. I think when we look at it and looking at it through the hindsight, um, our performance looks per horrendous um, from a quality improvement traditional perspective. But can we really say that quality improvement has ended? I would actually argue that quality is actually thriving for three reasons. Number one, quality is defined by more than initiatives and projects and scorecards. It's also about improving and facilitating care with empathy and kindness, which I think is actually amplified during COVID. Number two, quality is a team sport, is fueled by relationships and COVID actually allowed us to build and foster these relationships to really create power by number. Number three, COVID forced us to disperse and do what was needed. And in turn, it actually let us walk alongside different groups during the, some of those most challenging times to build capacity um, and to adapt to constant changes. And this actually allows to empower them at the same time to initiate quality improvements, regardless of who they are or what they do. Ultimately, I know that QI never stopped and we made a difference because we made improvements focusing on what matters to us, our colleagues and our patients and families. Well, thank you all again. That was fantastic. And as you have committed, I committed a quality improvement error by having the voting too early. And we we're worried about election fraud. This has happened recently, apparently. So we've checked everybody's voting credentials. They're all eligible and we're going to get you to vote again. So again, the uh, same format as before. All right, so we do have a clear victor. Uh, it was uh, about an 87, 88 to 12 on the against side, which is one would expect, and it is now 60 to 40 margin. So a fantastic job by the affirmative <laughs> in making some crucial points, and I would say a spirited and vigorous defense on the negative. And when you start out 88, 12, it's very hard to grow. So, yeah, but I, in compliments to our opponents, I think they did a fantastic job and they probably are the most improved. So well done. <laughs> likewise, Carl, thank you so much. Yeah, and, likewise. Okay. So you should all have a virtual drink together after this for not only a good time and excellent points made, but I do think we emerged with some excellent observations and common ground for the future. So again, on behalf of everybody, I want to thank you for a fabulous performance all. And if I were there in person, I would fist bump, masked, and uh, give you bottles of champagne uh, for your performances. Well done. Before we go, I have a few uh, concluding uh, remarks to make. Um, please fill out an evaluation. A link is in the file section of this session, and it will be pasted in the chat box by someone from the council. 
Next up is the showcase reception, which is a great time to check out on-demand presentations and chat with the people behind the work shared in the presentations. You can also visit the sponsor and exhibitor booths and learn more about their work. Don't forget to keep your eye out for hidden codes and redeem them for points in the gamification tab. And health, health talks start tonight at 7 p.m. And you can watch it right here with Seed Loop. By the way, um, I have to say, my two most favorite parts of quality form are traditionally this debate and the health talks. And the health talks are spectacular for both the format and the incredible creativity that people bring. So if you haven't signed up yet, uh, in my view, this is a must see. It is a brilliant, brilliant way to cover a lot of ground and see both seasoned and experienced and emerging and new and creative talent uh, who put their minds to the whole field of quality improvement. Mm -hmm.